All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, happy Sunday. And this is going to be another practice session from the Law's Guide to Nature Drawing and Journaling. And I know a lot of you own this book already. And even if you don't own the book, that's fine because we're going to be looking at mine here on the document camera. And so just what you do need, however, even if you don't have the Law's Guide to Nature Drawing and Journaling, is you're going to need your nature journal, obviously. It would be good for sure if you have a pencil, whether that is a graphite pencil or a non-photo blue pencil. That's what he usually recommends. Um, and then also some other drawing tool, potentially like ink. And then I also have my watercolor all ready to go. And then another thing that will be helpful is if you have any leaves, um, flower petals, or like a house plant that you can practice foreshortening on because we're going to do a little warm-up exercise that he suggests um, using those. But I will put mine under the document camera for anyone that, that doesn't have access to any leaves right now. But if you have a, um, this one right here would be especially good at this angle. If you have any house plants or leaves, um, go grab those real quick while I get everything set up. And if you do have the book, um, then set that up at your table so we can all work along together. So without further ado, I'm going to switch to the document camera um, and get this thing started. So switching to the document camera, and I see a lot of people posting in the live chat. So for all of you that don't know, over here on the right, you can type into the live chat. It's fun to converse with the other people that are here. So I know Ivea, Zephy, Sabrina, and Marilyn are all typing in the comments there. So um, good to see you all here. And um, let's get started with sort of this warm up. So we're on page um, 238 and 239. And this is the how to draw curling petals and then iris front to back. So he talks about a strategy for practicing on these types of four short end petals. This applies to leaves as well. I think this one right here is a really good example because there's this overlap. And a lot of times we get this incorrect uh, if we're not drawing carefully or else we just flatten these things out. And it's fine to flatten stuff sometimes in your drawings to simplify it. But if you're observing from real life or wanna get practice at getting in these three-dimensional shapes, especially with a complex flower such as an iris, then um, this is a good technique to practice. And you can see that he's separating these into, he's comparing it to a stained glass window um, and separating these into individual planes. You can see how he uses different colors on each one. Um, so we're gonna do a quick practice here just to warm up. So leave some space on your, your page for um, doing the sort of more finished one in a little bit. We're gonna go step by step. But right now let's start with a warm up and I will place, I'll try to place some stuff under the document camera in case you don't have any leaves or house plants or cut flowers to work from. Um, you can use um, these. So I cut this leaf right here. I picked this leaf um, and I'm going to try to set it up in a way that will work. You can see that it's foreshortened there. Um, I know it's kind of small, but I think that's how it's going to have to be. And then I'll also put this house plant underneath um, so that you could potentially practice from this one as well, such as this leaf right here is what I would recommend. Um, let's see if I can get the light a little bit better. And this is just a warm up, so it's partly just getting your um, hand eye coordination going and getting that movement in. I'll also hold this leaf um, for a little bit here. So I'm actually gonna start just with, um, I'll start with my uh, ink. And for the warm up, um, let's just focus on what he's recommending here, which is seeing shapes. So um, he's even breaking these down into separate shapes. He does this in his bird drawing book as well. So you can try it that way, or you can just kind of do a bunch of sketches just to warm up. And then we're going to really get into the exercise in a moment here. So you've got this leaf right here. You can do um, this leaf, or I'm going to hold up another, another, actually, I'm going to hold this leaf towards myself so that I have, um, a good one to practice for. So let's go ahead and, uh, I'm going to, um, give us about like three to five minutes to do this part. 
um, just to get warmed up. And he does for this, if you're close enough to, if you're cl this close to the plant, um, he does recommend closing one eye because if you have both eyes open, you're not seeing the same thing in each one at this distance. So go ahead and close one eye as you do this to um, get more the shapes more accurate. The more foreshortened it is, the more challenging it's going to be to draw. So like I have this leaf pointing straight at me, which is always the most challenging. Now I'm gonna try drawing this one. So don't worry about how this is gonna look right now. Um, just focus on getting warmed up a little bit. This is one of the most challenging parts of drawing plants. So if it doesn't feel easy, um, you're not alone. So you can see how on each of these leaves, it is at such an angle where there's two sides that are visible. And this is where he's using what he's using different colors for. Another thing you could do is uh, make one of those dark. So a lot of leaves um, have one side that is darker than the other. They also will often have one side that's in shade. And so all of these leaves, including this one, it just has a little bit, have one part that uh, you can see both planes of the leaf. So our tendency a lot of times um, because of the way our brain simplifies visual information is to flatten these leaves out. So you might have noticed that in your plant drawings, you always draw leaves like this and they are all just showing one side of the leaf. Um, but a lot of times in real life um, that the leaves are actually like this. So for example, this one right here that I set up for you, you can see there's two parts of it that are visible and it's the same, it's gonna be the same with this iris that we're about to draw. So go ahead, if you haven't, uh, we're just, if you haven't heard, we're just loosening up right now, practicing some foreshortened leaves. I have this one right here as an example that you can work from or any of the ones um, on this orchid, especially this one that's pointing towards you. And we're practicing from page 238 and 239 um, in John Muir Law's book. Okay, now that I did those, I'm just gonna do a couple where I'm actually not looking at a real object, but one that has already been drawn by him. So I'm just gonna actually sketch a few of these shapes from the book here. You can keep working on the leaves if you want, or if you have a leaf in front of you that you're doing. Sometimes it's good to do some warm ups like this that have less pressure on them before you try to do something that you're gonna make like more of a finished drawing out of. So you can see on this petal, there's multiple edges that are curved up. So there's that, that, and that, that are all showing the underside of the leaf. And this whole side is showing the, the above part, uh, not leaf, petal. Okay. If you haven't already, see if you can use color or blocking in dark to distinguish between the two planes, the two sides of the leaf. He's using different colors in the book, but I'm using um, just black ink on one side. Okay, I think that's enough of warm up there. Um, another exercise that he suggests on, I'm gonna move these plants out of the way now. Um, another exercise that he suggests on page 238 is um, using curled up paper and practicing from that. So you can rip shreds of paper and um, practice drawing them and see how here he's using these lines, sort of this hatching to show which side is which. Uh, so let's go straight into the exercise now. Um, so you can follow along here with my book or get your book ready. Let me adjust the... Um, Darkness here. Oh, Candy just joined in. Candy joined in and um, someone from fa on Facebook uh, in Seneca Falls, New York. I can't see 
your name because of the um, face your Facebook settings. But um, welcome everybody. Let me try to adjust this one more time here. What's going on? It's so dark. I'm not sure. I moved the plant out of the way and now it got really dark. Okay, anyways, let's just roll with it. Um, it'll probably, the camera will probably auto adjust here in a moment. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and read some of the text here. A front to back approach is especially helpful when drawing a subject with complex overlapping parts. It is easy to get lost in a flower. Having a strategy will help you work your way through. So what he's recommending is um, since we have these overlapping shapes, he's recommending starting in the back and moving forward. If you're used to doing watercolor landscapes, this sounds familiar uh, because that's how we often work with watercolor landscapes. So we're gonna be doing a similar thing here. Um, I'm gonna bring the camera down a little bit more here and see if that helps with the light. Okay, so we have a strategy that will help us with the complex shape according to him. Um, Drawing front to back is not a rule that must be followed, but a general guideline that will help solve many drawing problems. The same toolkit that you use to show depth in a landscape applies to the foreground, middle ground, and background of a single flower. If you do not know where to start, block in the basic shapes with light graphite or non-photo blue pencil. Check your proportions and negative shapes, then start drawing what is close to you. Do not be intimidated by complex shapes. They are made up of smaller, manageable parts. Okay, so get your, whatever your um, sort of sketching tool is, whether it's a graphite pencil, like what I'm using, or the non-photo blue pencil that he's recommending, either one of those will work. Um, and what we're gonna do is we're not drawing, he, he drew this from an actual flower, we're going to use his drawing um, and just follow along, and that's fine in this case. So for the first step, um, come on camera, what the heck? Okay, so for the first step, we're just gonna draw this closer edge. Oops, I need to leave more space for that. So this is the about the this is what the finished thing is gonna look like. So make sure you leave space when you start with this um, first one because that's gonna be way down here. All right, so I you can see I did that one surface. Now I'm going to make sure, I'm going to go back and do this line to indicate where it's folded over. Um, and he's recommending using a darker line. Um, so this is where line variation can help um, to use a darker line for this further away, um, the further away line. I'm going to do another just practice of this up here. Sometimes I like when I'm doing something like this, having like an extra sheet of paper where I'm just doing my um, sort of messy mark making. It takes the pressure off of the main drawing. Okay, and then he's saying a darker line, so darker line. Okay. All right, so we got that. Um, now he's saying check your negative shape to help you draw the angles of the sepals base. Um, okay, so this is a sepal, not a petal. This is the negative space he's talking about here. Um, so let's pay attention to that as we bring in this line here. This one I think is less of a concern perhaps. And I think I'm already making this so big that my flower is gonna fall off the page on this side. But I'm in, I'm using pencil, so I'm gonna just redo this whole thing. Some of you might get ahead of me on the steps and that's fine, especially cause I'm talking, it always takes way longer. Okay, so let's see, I'm gonna go all the way over here and um,
Okay, so hopefully you're paying attention to that negative space and I'm noticing that this line that comes up here should be kind of lining up with this line at the top and getting that angle right is going to help get the, um, the sort of gestalt feel of this flower. And then it angles down here. Okay, so the negative shape, he's showing kind of that, oh, well, you could pay attention to this negative shape in here. And sometimes with painting, we would do this for sure. But look at this negative shape to make sure you get that angle right. Okay. Um, next. Oh, Terry is here too. Yes, Terry, we all struggle with foreshortening. Absolutely. And he has several other exercises in in this section of the book about foreshortening with leaves. Okay, so I keep looking down here and wanting to skip ahead, but all right, next part. Um, now add the pistil arching up from behind the base of the sepal. Complex shapes are made up of smaller parts. I think that's the third time he said that. Deconstruct them and build them one at a time, seeing each as a simple shape. So you can see here, he's doing this sort of sketch of um, all of the different parts that go into this. So I'm going to zoom in right now a little bit closer, or I'll hold this up because this part is, um, is rather complex. But the part that we're going to draw is, um, oops, just bump the mic. The part that we're going to draw is this part here. You can see this is the underside, this is the top, this is the underside, this is the top, and then that's the underside. So there's a lot of folding back and forth, and that's what's hard about this um this part that we're going to draw so you can see here how he shows it he shows this is the underside this is the top this is that underside again this is the top again and this is a little bit more of the underside if you want on your little separate side of your paper like over here for example you could practice those shapes um so just for the sake of practice i'm going to do that over over here and i'm going to draw um, that underside shape, then I'm going to draw the curving shape on top, then I'm going to draw the underside shape on the lip or whatever that is, then I'm going to draw this here, and then there's one more that is like that. So let me see if I can combine those all together here. So that's basically what we're going to try to draw over here now. Okay. I think I need to get a new light that's like brighter because I think that's the problem that the camera is not, the camera needs it to be a little bit brighter here. Okay. So now let's go fit this one in here. And when you're doing things piece by piece like this, that can help you simplify the shapes, but it can mess you up in terms of the relationships between the different parts. So don't forget how this is supposed to be in relationship to this other part of the flower here. way too much and back in so it should have this still this whole shape should be arching relative to this petal um, or sepal down below here I'm not getting the sophisticated line variation I'm sort of doing that thing that I did last Sunday where um, I end up with this sort of scratchy like little short lines because I'm tentatively building it um, instead of going for these like longer smoother strokes because I'm unsure of the shapes that I'm drawing so finding the balance between that accuracy and getting those good mark making and line variation is is a is definitely a balancing act okay 
Okay, so this is supposedly, why does it say, oh yeah, front to back. So these are the two parts of the flower that are furthest forward. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go backwards um, and do the two petals that are next furthest back. Um, they're not all petals. So I'm just gonna use the term petal, um, but botanically speaking, these aren't all petals. It's more complicated on an iris than that. Okay, so I got that in. Now we're gonna do these two. So that's this one right here and this one over here. I'm just gonna kind of, I'm gonna erase that because that's in the way. And what I'm actually gonna do is I'm gonna just kind of gauge the size here first. I don't always do this, but I wanna get this accurate, so. Um, I'm gonna gauge the size. I think it's at least up to here and it's probably like this wide. Okay, so now I'm gonna start here and I'm gonna, this is sort of the mid rib. This comes out like this. Oh, this is where I marked the top, remember, so I don't wanna make it too long. There's the fold right there. Now this should line up kind of with the midrib. There's that other fold there in the middle. And then the curls on the side. Okay, now I'm gonna erase these sort of measurement marks here. Get rid of that, because that's extra. I pushed a little bit too hard with the graphite there, so it's kind of worked into the paper too much. Um, okay, so there's that. I think that one might actually be um, that this one is actually a petal, this one is a sepal, and that one's a pistol. That's a it's a weird, weird pistol. I don't know. That's surprising. Uh, maybe Eva can chime in on the um, botanical flower parts on this one. Okay, so got that. I think that I'm okay with that. Now there's the leftmost. This one is a sepal. So that's a modified leaf, even though it looks like a petal in this case. All right, and I think we still need to leave room on this one because there's gonna be another pistol on top of that. So make sure you leave this space, see how much arc there is right there. So um, leave plenty of space there. I'm not used to erasing so much. I've been working with ink so much um, for my nature journaling. And so it's it's interesting psychologically. Okay, this is about that big. Oh, I should have measured this and also look at the other one because I don't want it to be like way bigger than that one, right? And it should be ending at about the same place. So ending about there. So if you're ahead or a little bit behind or a little bit ahead, that's that's fine. Um, some of these are really weird shapes, like they're not easy. Um, so um, don't worry about it. And it looks like Eva is suggesting, you know, trying like a blind contour or modified blind contour drawing just to practice these shapes. So if you start getting frustrated with, if you're really fixated on trying to get this final version um, like I said, have a side page here where you're just doing your doodles and, and loosening up your hand and practicing the shapes Then come back here and try to get the, the one that's going to be the poly more polished illustration. 
Okay, it's time for a chocolate break. We're about 20 minutes into the drawing. This is like 95%, so hopefully it's not overly strong for me. If my hand starts shaking, then this is a new one. I haven't tried it before, but it was at Grocery Outlet, so fair trade, organic, 95%. I can't pronounce the name, so all, all good signs of a good chocolate. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, we're done with step number five. Step number six. Now we see the advantage of drawing front to back. As the leftmost pistol and the rear pedals tuck behind the shapes already drawn. Oh, I'm just now noticing these really faint lines that he made here. Um, so he, oh man, I wish I had seen that before. Look, he has these very faint, um, because it's his non-photo blue pencil, it doesn't even show up in the book very much, but look at these very faint circles that he has because he's trying to show the three-dimensionality of this. And you can see he's drawn in these faint circles here I mean, these are ellipses technically because they're in um, perspective and he's showing that's kind of giving you the illusion or the indication of how this um, flower is three dimensional and is coming up like that. Um, so if that helps you, I wish I had seen that, uh, noticed that earlier, but I, I'm going to use it for this next part because see these three these three petals are all in relationship. Like if you were looking at them from above, it would be a circle with one petal here, one petal here, and one petal there. If you're looking at it from straight above, that's what it would look like. So I'm gonna draw a little um, ellipse and drawing ellipses is like a classic drawing practice because ellipses are really hard for us to understand. Um, circles in perspective, our brain flattens them out. So I think something like that is gonna help me get these three all in the right location. Cindy didn't notice those either in her book. Yeah, I, I, I think that's one of the weird things about using non-photo blue pencil is it's the whole point of it is so that it doesn't, it's not photocopyable, but for a book, like sometimes he has to use um, a different thing to give you so that you can actually see where the non-photo blue pencil is. But in this case, it doesn't really show up um, okay, so let's get that in. I got that ellipse. That's going to help me place my next two petals. Oh, there's a, um, there's also this pistol. So I guess I'll lay that down first and fill in some of the space in this gap here. Whoa. The pistols seem to be the hardest part to draw. At least for me, they're complicated. But see, look now, see this is a, I messed up because look, this should be um, similar in height. I should have a circle here for the pistols. That ended up being too, either I made, I think I over exaggerated the size of this one. And now I need to sort of try to match this one. So at, at least it's at the same height so check across, um, as you draw in this pistol, check across to make sure it's kind of equivalent to that other one, at least in the basic kind of basic height there. I could also go back and maybe make this one a little bit smaller. So I think that's the initial mistake that I made. I wonder how this would work if I had just tried, if I saw this in the field and I just tried it with ink, how off would I be? Um, and how much faster would it be to draw it? Because this is definitely sort of painstaking construction. It still to me looks like this is way lower. So I'm actually gonna go back and um, 
adjust this to make this a little bit smaller because I think that's my initial mistake. His is not quite that big, I don't think. All right, that looks a lot closer to me. Does that look about right? Um, I'm gonna go with it. Okay, so then I, I got that. Now I have these two petals um, that are gonna go up to this circle here. So I've got these in that circle. And now I've got these other petals that have to go up to this one. I'm gonna just put in the basic shape first and then get, this is always a strategy is that you can just draw a shape like this to get the basic length and width. Um, and then you could come back and draw in the wavy and get the wavy to match that line. Cause sometimes if you just freehand a wavy leaf or a wavy petal, it won't match up. It'll be like all wonky. So if you have to trace out the kind of just oval shape of it, um, and notice that this one is in the in the front. These ones are in the back, so they should go further up. So I'm gonna just, tr oh, this one needs to be way further this way, I think, at least according to his drawing. Okay, so see how I'm just tracing this kind of generic oval shape, and then I'm gonna come in with the details next. But we also want to remember that our background shapes are going to be paler, but we could probably do that with watercolor um, when we color this in. And he doesn't provide the tutorial for the watercolor um, on this page. He just gives the tutorial for how to get the drawing. Um, but we can figure that out on our own. Okay, so one thing I want to point out here with this overlap um, is... Uh, you, there's ways that you can overlap things and it could be in real life. It actually overlaps um, where this line lines up with this line on the foreground object. But as an artist, you want to change that because it can be really confusing. So like, for example, see this pedal right here. If I have another pedal behind it or like say there's like a bird wing behind it and the line of the bird wing goes like this and intersects like right here and comes out here. That's going to look really confusing because those lines are so close to each other. So instead of doing that, it's better to adjust that location slightly. So it's like coming in more perpendicular um, so that the overlap is more clear between those two objects and the brain doesn't get confused. See what I'm saying? So like right here, I have a, an overlap that could potentially do that. Um, so I, I'm going to exaggerate this fold um, to emphasize it and emphasize that these are two separate shapes. See how I made that now more perpendicular? This line is more perpendicular. This line is more perpendicular to that one. So it's less likely to cause that confusion. There's a technical term for that in art, um, line intersection or line confusion or parallel line something something but i can't remember what it is right now if any of you know please post it in the comments okay oh cool wildflowers creations is here with their nine-year-old son thank you for joining in um okay next we are going to do this last one and it looks like it actually comes through a little bit behind this pistol right there. So make sure that lines up. Um, I'm going to avoid the overlap there because I don't want that overlap to be too close, just like I was just mentioning. Add my ruffles in, and there's like this curve here. It's not really iris season where I live. Like I think there's some cultivated ones. But the wildflower irises, I think, are mostly done around where I live. Maybe some places at the coast. Okay, now I'm going to go through. Oh, shoot. There's still more back here I'm seeing. Okay, so never mind. I'm not going to erase my guidelines. Um, okay, so step seven. The background sepal and pistol are mostly obscured by the structures in the foreground and middle ground. 
use a light line and restrain yourself from adding any detail here. So similar to when we do watercolor, you want to have the least amount of detail, contrast, saturation, darkness, and warmth in the background. And that's how our brain interprets what's closer or what's further. So he's showing that there is, there are, uh, there is like one more, I guess that's one more, what is it? One more sepal and pistol way in the back. Um, and it, it looks like you could probably get away with not even showing that at all, but let's, uh, we're not going to be that easy on ourselves. We're not going to take that uh, escape route here. We're going to go for it. And it looks like it comes out straight. So this is one of these. Let's remember that this is one of these structures and one of these structures. So one, two, one, two. It's going to be that back here. So hopefully it's, but it looks like the way that it's angled. So that means it's matching up with, it should be matching up with this circle here. Um, his looks like it goes a little bit further beyond that, but okay. All right, so that's the last one. Now I'm going to go through and I'm going to start erasing my construction lines. Whoops, that was not a construction line. If any of you are feeling frustrated or stuck, um, when you do a step-by-step -step like this, um, try to notice like what you're feeling instead of just being what you're feeling and sort of like giving up or whatever. So if you start, give, if you notice that you really, really want to give up, what I recommend is um, going over to your other page here and just messing around. So like, for example, one thing that you could mess around with um, that's going to build all the skills you need to do this kind of thing is draw a wavy line like this, like a wavy leaf like that, and then draw this, these kind of matching up like this. And this would be the background part of that petal or leaf. Um, and then maybe draw it wavy again over here and then color this in and just practice doing that like a couple times. And what does it take to like this one that I was drawing there? What does it take to kind of see that or make it look like it's doing that? Because you need a certain amount of curve to give the illusion that it's that wavy leaf. Oh, I have another plant that is perfect for practicing this. It's like one of those really common, I think it's actually a type of fern, even though it doesn't look like one and it has these wavy, wavy leaves. So just doing something like that a million times is gonna practice the skills um, that you need for this. So don't, um, you know, if you notice yourself, like if you notice your mental obstacle preventing you from drawing more, um, even if you decide to abandon this project, just keep your hand moving. Um, and just by doing that, you're going to keep getting better. Sometimes these things are hard, but your mental reaction to, to the challenge is what's going to, you know, have the biggest impact. Um, and so as long as you just keep drawing and keep trying at least something, um, even if you have to kind of switch strategies, it's it's that's totally fine. The problem is, is if you give up or, or don't start at all. OK, so I'm just going to keep going through here and erasing these construction lines. Um, that's sort of the iterative strategy that I use is when I'm trying to draw something and I get frustrated, I'll just keep going over and over again. Sabrina is going to bed now. Good night, Sabrina. Sabrina is in Germany, so it's way later later over there. Thanks for joining in. I'm glad that these um, Sunday times, um, do work somewhat for you. Okay. So just cleaning these up. You can also use a kneaded eraser for this kind of stuff. The ne my kneaded eraser is really cold and hard right now, but the kneaded eraser can be a really, um, subtle way to kind of 
see how like my lines are just overly dark right there uh the kneaded eraser is a good way to kind of lighten that up um you can actually lift the lift the lines up um by i mean when i was a kid i had no idea how these worked i was not really interested in learning like new stuff um when i was drawing as a kid but like now i know you just soften it up like this you get a nice new area like that and you can just push the eraser down and lift it up and it will soften those lines see how it picked that up so in these areas if you're noticing um that you didn't do line variation um you can use this to uh you can use one of these erasers to uh, to subtly lift that up because what happens is when you use this kind of an eraser uh when you go through you're actually kind of leaving these eraser lines um and it's often not um it doesn't look natural or it's not consistent like there's just these places where it's completely white and then places where it's dark whereas with this you just kind of subtly knock down the values just a little bit lighter you can of course rub with this thing too or even draw with this thing um, and make a really narrow sharp edge to the eraser and erase with that so um, they might seem like just like sort of a gimmick but they're actually a really really amazing um, art tool once you know how to use them Okay, so I think I've cleaned this up enough, and um, I'm going to put in a little bit of the this part down here that he's showing um, before I start getting ready for uh, the watercolor. My voice might be kind of weird because yesterday I was teaching nature journaling to a group of like a whole group of kids, um, maybe about like 13 to 15 kids ranging in age from five to like 11 or 12. Um, there was a bunch of adults as well. And um, I was wearing a mask, um, even though we were outdoors, you know, we were, we were trying to be careful and all of that. But I was talking really, I had to talk really loud to project my voice and my throat got really sore. Um, I'm gonna skip this right here. I don't wanna draw that. Um, just because uh, this is an example where certain subject matters are hard to draw. And um, see how even though John Muir Laws is obviously an amazing artist and practices a lot and has drawn lots of flowers um, and has done a really good job of rendering it, the way this crumpled up petal looks, it just looks kind of weird. And that's because of the subject, not because of his rendering of it. So that's the kind of thing where you can if you have the knowledge to recognize that before you try to draw it, you won't blame it on yourself because this is not, um, this looking weird is not because of the artist. It's because of that subject matter is hard to draw. It's the same with some of these foreshortened things. Like if you were to draw this leaf, the way that I'm holding it right now, a lot of people aren't going to recognize what that shape is. Um, and so as an artist, you can choose like, okay, I know that that was a hard subject and it might look weird if I draw it. So I'm gonna actually skip that and get my watercolor um, watercolor stuff ready. And remember, once you put watercolor over graphite, the graphite is going to be more permanent. So lighten up anything that you're worried about now because once you put watercolor on it, it's gonna be committing it to the paper um, a lot more. So I'm actually gonna put the Oh, no, actually, I'm going to leave the book out here so we can definitely see the colors on it and get my watercolor out. So the main colors that I'm seeing, it's really cool because purple and green are actually um, like almost opposite on the color wheel from each other. So they are basically like complement, they're complementary or triadic complements. Um, I think they're triadic complements, depending on the purple and the green. Um, but that means they're straight across from each other on the color wheel, or almost straight across from each other on the color wheel, which is really cool. And that means that if you add a little bit of green to your purple, it'll tone it down, tone down the saturation, and vice versa. So um, this plant has both, and it also has some yellow. So we're going to start with the palest color first, because 
we don't want to lose that one. So let's see. I'm going to clean my brush, make sure my brush is clean already. I'm going to zoom out here too. Okay, so this is pretty much Windsor Violet, but I'm not going to start with that part. I'm going to start with a little bit of, of like, uh, I'm going to start with Hansa Yellow Light, really pale, um, and try to get this. There's also white on here, so we want to make sure we reserve some of that white. Um, so it looks like there's a little bit of yellow there and a little bit of yellow on the underneath part of this. And I'm actually going to paint the yellow everywhere that's going to have green. That will sort of connect those areas. And this is something that if you've seen my landscape painting videos, I do that in my landscapes also. So that's getting a little bit more golden than I want. I want the like really saturated yellow. So I'm going to go back and clean, clean my brush because your yellow is the one you least want to contaminate. And this looks like it's very pure yellow. So I'm going to get a little bit of that, keep it clean. I'm just diluting it. I'm not mixing it. I'm just diluting it slightly here. Um, and then I'm going to come in and do that, especially on that front facing one, because that's the closest. So I really want that strong warm color here in that petal that's coming out towards us. Strong, warm, saturated yellow. So that is going to be my most warm color in this entire painting. Okay, so we don't really need to wait for that to dry. I'm going to come in and do my green right now. So I'm just going to get Serpentine Genuine. Um, other greens could work as well. Serpentine Genuine might even be a little bit too yellow. I know when the irises that I see here often have a pretty, um, pretty like uh, straight up green. So like the hooker's green um, is as close to that like saturated Crayola green. And there's a little bit of veination, but I'm not going to worry about that right now. I'm just going to put the green over everything. And this leaf kind of tapers away around the back of that petal there. So that's about it for the green. Um, once that dries, I will come back and do those veins. He might've done that with colored pencil um, after it was dry. Okay, so now being careful that I don't put my the heel of my hand down on that and then smear it, I'm going to, I can paint these other areas while that is still slightly wet, or you could wait if you wanna be really careful, or you could use your blow dryer Please mute your microphone when you use your blow dryer. Now I'm going to use Windsor Violet, which is basically like a pure purple. Purple is a triadic color, so it's not a primary color. Wait, no, it's not a triadic color. It's a secondary color. Um, so it's from mixing blue and like pink. So the quinacridone pink for me is basically the primary that's more primary than red, actually. So this Windsor Violet is basically a cross between a really saturated blue and a um, really satur saturated magenta. So that's that to me looks basically like what this flower is. So I'm gonna dilute it and um, start with the background first. So I'm testing it over here on this paper. Let me get a clean clean sheet of this. You can always make it darker, but you can't make it lighter. So that looks good to me. And I'm going to do everything with that. So this is this is a, a classic strategy. So you have to make sure you make enough of the wash, especially if it's a, a, a mixed color. Make sure you're going to make enough to do multiple um, glazes, so multiple layers of this wash. So I'm going to mix a little bit more, actually. Um, and then dilute it to your weakest dilution for your background and then do everything. So paint 
the whole thing, I, that still might not be enough. So I'm going to make a little bit more because I always end up making the mistake, make, making the mistake of not mixing enough of this. Um, cause you'll see in a second why this is important. Okay. So now I'm going to test it. That's diluted enough. Cause what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this purple in all of this. Um, okay. So except for, I have to remember there's this, actually, I'm going to use my pencil. This is something I usually don't do cause I don't have time for it cause I'm in the field. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually draw around where I want to reserve white. So I make sure that I don't do that. Okay, now everything else is gonna get this purple, but let's make it more diluted. So I'm just squeezing my brush with this type of water brush, uh, the Pintel Aquash. I can just squeeze water to dilute it. If you're using a traditional watercolor brush, you will just put your brush into your water dish and add water to this mix. Okay, that's looking about right. Okay, so I'm going to go in and do everything real quick. So that's pale enough for the background, but I'm not just going to paint the background because this is the way that you can use watercolor to really suggest depth is you do everything the same. Ooh. I probably should have used my um, brush that puts out water faster because I'm doing such a big wash that I, I want it to be even. I don't want to show brush strokes. And you probably already know that um, the way that you achieve that with watercolor is by um, connecting all of the areas, connecting the brush strokes while everything is still wet. Otherwise, you'll see these lines where it dried. Like there, for example. But you can use, you'll notice that I went up to these boundaries here. See, that one is going to show up. I don't like that. But these other boundaries are going to, would be there anyway, so that's fine. So I'm going to reload my brush with some more of this wash um, and go in and do, wait, I should check, check, double check it first. Okay. I'm being more precise in this practice than how I usually nature journal in the field. So it's good. I think a lot of times people... Kind of just do what's comfortable for them and then they start calling that their style um but it's good to be able to like recognize where your natural you might be like i don't even want to say the word natural um it's good to recognize what you're kind of more comfortable with and what you um what comes easier for you um and sort of distinguish between that and like what is just easy or um, like an, a, a place where you're not going to actually learn anything new. And so for me, a lot of times the, the easy thing is to do quick sketches, um, in the field and not spend a long time, like fussing about precision. So right now though, I'm at home and I'm doing a practice from his book. That's about sort of precision and more like illustration. So I'm going to lean into that and try to make sure like, okay, let me get this wash, right? So this might not be like leaning into those things that are a little bit more challenging for you, that growth edge, that might not be the thing that you want to do if you're, uh, you know, nature journaling at the very end of the day and you had a really long day and you're kind of stressed out. Um, maybe that's the time to do what comes easier for you. Um, like what I call your, um, your uh, bread and butter or your juice, which is what gives you the most energy. Those are the things that are good to do when you're tired and stressed out. And then if you have a little bit extra energy or you're doing an intentional practice, then lean into those things that are harder for you. Okay, so I kind of went back and fussed with that one to make it a little bit darker, but that's our basic um, first layer. And so for our background um, petals, sepals, pistols, etc., we're gonna leave them that pale. And then once this dries, we're gonna go in and put down another layer for these ones that are darker. So while that's happening, let's go ahead and do our um, the veination on our stem. So you can do that with watercolor or if you have 
Um, if you have a colored pencil, you could do colored pencil um, once this is dry down here. Thanks, Ivea, for posting those those terms. Okay, so I'm gonna get a slightly darker green or even the same wash because the cool thing about watercolor is even if you have, so if you have the same wash from doing the leaf the first time, um, you don't need to change the color to go back and add um, darker areas. And if you use just another layer of the same darkness, same color, it's gonna make it darker. And the cool thing about that is it just looks more natural than if you come in with a completely separate color um, and paint on top of your first wash. And it's convenient because as long as you mix enough, um, you have that color just ready to go. All right, that's kind of subtle, but giving a little bit of variation so it's not just a monolithic green there. Um, and then I'm gonna, it looks like it's darker towards the tip, so I'm going to um, do that as well. Okay, and remember it's fine to add details here. This is not your closest part. This is probably the closest part to the viewer. Maybe this is sort of close to you, but this is relatively close, so it's fine to add some details there. We just really don't want to add details to this um, or this back here. It looks like he did some, but not very much. And he really pushed these ones a lot darker than what we have right now. So oh, let's see, my in my conditions, this is pretty much dry already. So I'm going to go back to my purple the same purple here. Luckily, I mixed a whole bunch of it. Um, I'm noticing there's some color variation in his, but I'm like, there's a little bit of this like warmer color near the edge. Um, I'm going to, let's see, how should I do that? I'm going to do a little bit of wet on wet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this other color, closely related color. It's naphthamide maroon. So it's a little bit more towards that um, magenta than towards the blue in terms of a purple. Um, and it gives me that sort of warmer, redder color that I'm noticing on the edge of the petal. And I'm gonna get a little bit of that, um, get it really wet um, and put it on this um, petal here on the edges. And then I'm gonna drop the purple in while it's still, I'm, I gotta make sure this is happening really wet. Um, and then I'm gonna drop that purple in um, so that I can get like a wet on wet blend with it. So while that's still wet, I'm gonna come in here and grab my other purple, the Windsor Violet. Um, and ooh, it feels like it's heavy. Whoa, almost dropped my brush. Okay, coming in now. There we go. See how it's, it's wet? So that might be a little bit more messy wet on wet than I wanted, but um, he might have actually added a little bit of blue. So pushing pushing that middle part a little bit further towards the blue end of the spectrum. I don't want the wet on wet um, effect to take over the painting or be distracting, but there we go. Got that there. This looks like he toned it down a little bit more by mixing it with green, but that's fine. Okay, so now I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna get this one. Um, and I'm just gonna do these both. The simple thing to do would just to be do these both exact same. That gives me just one grade of, of darker, uh, more saturated than the last one. So it just kind of steps it up one from that back one. Because if, if it's too big of a jump in darkness, um, it'll look weird. So that is something you have to kind of try to get the, the balance there. It looks like the purple overlaps this yellow here a little bit. I don't want to leave all that yellow because that's not how it actually looks. So it, see how that's cool? It tones the um, tones the purple down when you go over the yellow. Obviously, it tones the yellow down also. 
but the yellow still kind of shows through a little bit. That's like one of the miracles of watercolor is that transparency. And a lot of things, especially like plants and flowers have that transparency and that those overlapping colors. So the watercolor is really good at um, kind of representing that. Okay, so this one came out like way dark, but that's fine because I think that's pretty far forward. And now I just have this one here. Oh, that's a little bit too, too dark. So I'm using the sharp part of my brush to put in those lines there, the lines on the petal. And you can do that with these um, Pintel Aquash water brushes do form a pretty sharp point. Um, otherwise I could come back later and use like a separate brush, but this brush, you can get a lot of line variation with it. So I, I do the line work. Um, in this case, it didn't come out that dark, so I'll probably have to come back again, but you can get those veins or whatever. I'm gonna soften that edge a little bit. That didn't quite come out the way that I wanted, but sometimes you just gotta leave it. All right, so I'm gonna eat another piece of chocolate while this is drying slightly. Okay, the other thing we can do is so there's local color on the petals and then there's also the colors and the darkness that suggest where overlaps are. So for example, on this pistol right here, making it darker underneath will suggest the overlap and the three dimensionality. So I'm going to go in and just put a little bit, it might be a little bit too much, a little bit like that. I'm gonna do it up here too. I don't think he 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 didn't really do this, um, but I'm just gonna do because my flower is looking kind of two dimensional, so I'm gonna darken it here as well. I'm also darkening it here where it comes into the leaves. I also want to tone that down. I don't want that to be so saturated down here. Okay. Oh, Karen Colson's here. Yeah, we're going to be doing a couple of these, Karen, just because it feels like a good way to kind of, at least for me, <laughs> motivate me to actually go through and do some of these ones in the book that I never, never quite get the uh, discipline and motivation enough to just sit down and do them by myself. So this gives me an, a good excuse. All right, I'm going to add some veins in on this one. This is the one where I tried to put that warm sort of wet on wet. The wet on wet didn't work that great, but there is some of the warm color in there, which I think is enough of the warm color. It's fine. So I'm going to get some of the same purple um, and see if that's dark enough for me to get some of these veins. It's probably going to be too light. He probably did pencil. So if you have pencils, colored pencils, um, once you think you're done with the sort of watercolor parts of it, you can come in and I think I'm going to mix like a separate darker thing here to do that. But once, uh, once you're done with the watercolor wash, 
because I don't think you really want to be putting colored pencil down until you're done with the watercolor. Um, you can come in with that, uh, the, the colored pencil and put in veins and stuff like this. So with a brush, it is, it actually makes a difference for like veins like this, which direction you're brushing in. So for example, I started off going this way and going this way, it leaves a fatter end and I don't want the fatter end. I want it to taper to a point. So I'll show you right here is um, if I start here and go this way, oops, it's easier to make the fat end at the, at the, where the brush leaves off. Um, so if you want a really fine tip, start with the fine part because it's more likely that the end of the brush stroke is going to end up being fat. See that? Hopefully that makes sense. So these are veins, not just stripes. So making some of them branching and stuff like that is helpful. Otherwise they just look like stripes, but this is also one of those things that can be really fun and you can get all excited about it and overdo it. Ooh, and my hand was shaking on that one. So it made a really weird pattern. There, I think that's good. And I don't wanna to put too much detail there. Now, what I need to do is this one's further forward. So I need to add some, to balance that out, I'm gonna to need to add some detail over here and probably even some over here. Um, so I'll just add a little bit. Ooh, that's a little bit too dark for that one, shoot. So if something comes out too dark, what you can do is you can clean your brush. So I'm cleaning my brush on a towel over here and I'm gonna come back and just go over it and sort of hopefully lighten it without making it just look terrible. There, that's probably fine. It's just kind of a fat line down the middle, but whatever. Okay, now I'm gonna come over here and I wanna balance this one with that one. So I'm gonna add some veins on this one. It looks like they do go through the white part, which is kind of cool. They go around the yellow part. And then they kind of go straight here. Okay, and then I have to remember I have the overlapping petal there, so I don't want to lose that overlapping part because that was like one of the whole points of doing this. You can see he's used a white gel pen, so we're going to try to do that also. Um, he used a white gel pen that makes that part stand out. So you can see um, the white gel pen is because he didn't reserve the whites there. That would have been really hard to res reserve the whites on those edges. You can see in a couple places there, he's used a white gel pen to show where that overlap is because especially right now with our watercolor, putting in some of these details of the petal texture and the local color, we've lost where the, um, we've lost where those edges and those overlaps are. And that was one of the main things we were trying to work on for this exercise. If people want, you can start voting for what we're going to do next Sunday. Cause I wait, Oh, next Sunday, I have an interview, but, um, what page from John Muir Law's book do you want to do, um, practice next? I think we'll be able to get in like two or three more of these before Inktober. And then I'm going to be doing totally different stuff in Inktober. Okay, so now I'm gonna tinker around a little bit and go back to my leaf, my green, because now I feel like the green's not um, sort of like popping enough. Or contrasty enough, so. Sometimes you have to do this, uh, especially this is why oil painting can, you know, it can take you multiple years to finish one oil painting because you can just keep going back and you're like, oh, because it's all about the relationships between 
the colors and values. Um, so you're like, okay, now I made the purple darker. Okay, now I need to make that darker. Okay, I added some more details over here. Now I need to balance this out. Oh, now I need to soften that. And you just keep going back and forth. Luckily with watercolor, we can basically only go in one direction with that. But if you start really subtle like we did today, um, it can um, go on for a while. And then eventually you just have to stop. So I'm going to darken this um, a little bit here to make sure that my shadows are still kind of visible. But you can see how if you take it slow with the values, you can keep kind of adjusting more and more. If you go quickly with the values, which is like what you have to do when you're in the field, you get kind of like one chance and then that's it. So you don't really get to go back and um, keep um, adjusting them. But you can only, like I, I just said, you can only go in one direction with watercolor. Uh, and also remember, we're getting further and further away from this, how dark these petals are in the background. And we don't want that to be too big of a difference or else it will look like, okay, let me just mess with it. I, ideally, we wouldn't touch those anymore back there, but I think I'm going to do a little bit and it looks like he did too. So um, if John Muir Laws did it, then um, I have an excuse, right? So I'm going to go in here and be try to be really subtle. Maybe it won't even be enough to see. Um, and this one too, just to kind of, I don't want the difference to be too huge between these ones. You want to have some of that atmospheric perspective so that those things that are further away fade into the background, but you don't want it to be too much or it'll look fake or they'll look too far away. The crazy thing is people's brains, even if they don't know about art, their brain interprets all of this information to um, create the illusion, um, create the illusion of death. And, you know, like, so people's brains see that this is lighter than that. And even though the person's not aware of it, they're like, oh, yeah, that looks like a real flower. And it looks like it's 3D, but they don't even know what that rule is that is causing them to see it that way. Okay, I'm feeling kind of okay with this. I think I'm just going to look here and see sort of what we're missing. Uh, maybe put in a little bit of a darker wash over the whole petal. Um, look at it from a little bit further away sometimes helps. And then let it dry so that we can do the, um, the fun gel pin part. So hopefully, I, I forgot to mention gel pins at the beginning, but um, hopefully you have some of the gel pins, white gel pins. Um, I use the Uniball Signo ones all the time. Okay, so I'm going to do something slightly different. I'm going to make a little wash here with a little bit of this warm stuff and come in and try to just get this overall um, petal a little bit darker. So ideally, I would have done this before the veins, but I didn't. So I'm going to have to do it now, and hopefully it won't ruin all that work I did with the veins. So you can see how this is just a wash that's just slightly adjusting it a little bit darker and a little bit warmer. And I'm gonna do the same thing on that side. Just a little bit darker and a little bit warmer around this yellow. I think I'm also gonna adjust my yellow a little bit too. That kind of worked. I think that worked. Now I kind of wanna do a little bit on there. <laughs> okay, and that, that looks fine. Oops, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> okay, okay. Let that dry. Okay, I think I'll get my brush really, really clean because I'm gonna put a little bit of yellow in. The yellow's not touching any of those wet things I just did, so I think it'll be fine to do it while it's still drying. Get a little bit of this Hansa yellow light. Hansa yellow medium would probably be good too. There we go. Just a little bit. Just pop that a little bit there. But that's still my main yellow. A little bit more into these. It's all about relationships. So like if I start putting in a ton of yellow here, a ton of yellow there, a ton of yellow down here, it's just going to take away. So I really want to keep this as the yellowest part. Cool. 
Cool. It sounds like Marilyn is working with um, uh, colored pencils. So it's, it is fun to try and, and just kind of see how people uh, results are with different media. And it sounds like um, Eva is recommending page 263 for next time. So while this is drying, I'm going to skip to page 263. Another fun thing to do while um, doing something like this would be to keep like a running, um, some running notes here about your process or your feelings around it. Cause for me, like what I'm noticing is I'm looking at this page and sure it looks like a cool watercolor of an iris, but my aesthetic is, I think it would look even more beautiful if there was like some words next to it. Um, so even if that were like about my process, um, uh, that would be a fun thing to put. So let's, let's flip through the book here and see, um, Vez recommending 263. I wonder if I've done that. Oh, I don't think I've done this one. Oh, Deciduous Trees. Yeah, this is a cool one. I've never done it. Well, here, it looks like there's a couple things going on on, on this spread here. Because he's got the um, oak tree step-by-step, step, um, which ends here. And then he's got this trees in, in winter. Oh, so, so this one's, yeah, this is a really simple one. I think this would be really fun. Trees are one of those things where it's like, easy an easy subject a lot of times to make it look good um that would be a quick one yeah we could probably do that that's probably we could probably do that in like 15 minutes um yeah so if anyone else has any ideas of which page um from the book they want to try um let me know this one looks like it would be fun and pretty uh, pretty easy there's definitely some in here that are like way more like what was there's some of these that look like they're, this one's not, what we just did was not that easy. Um, but like, for example, these iridescent beetles, those always scare me. And I've only tried that a few times or some of the birds. Let's see. Oh, that looks fun. Oh my gosh. With rocks. Oh yeah. I actually have not really done this very many times. Gouache on white paper. That would be cool. These kind of things, these, these are hard. This, I still have not yet to be able to, I've tried it a couple times. I took his class at Wild Wonder and I still have trouble with that. Um, oh, Cindy wants to do the crashing waves. I think someone else wanted to do that too. That is a good idea. Let's look at that page. Waterfalls, not easy water especially when there's these colors on the edge not easy more water not easy <laughs> Ooh, is this the one that is wow 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 yeah i think we should try this one um it looks like a challenge for sure what media is this Okay, so there's there's white gouache, definitely a lot of white gouache. Oh, okay, these are two separate ones. So we could do, there's this one and then there's this one. Um, uh, white gouache, watercolor, what else? Oh, there's a crayon. Okay, so um, we would need people, everybody needs to have a white crayon to be able to do this one. Um, I don't currently have a white crayon, but I could get one. And then watercolor and permanent white gouache. So let's make sure that everybody knows what to do, what to get. But I think this could be um, this could be a really fun one. I can't tell if this continues on to here or if this is two separate ones. Uh, I think this does continue, and then this is a separate one. Anyways, that's a great suggestion. Um, I'll put up an official poll. Um, if you haven't seen that already on my YouTube channel, there's a section where people can, uh, where, where I can post comments and people can vote on things. Um, it's in like the community tab or something like that. So try to vote officially on there um, so we can have it be as fair as possible because um, not everybody's here um, right now. Okay, so let's go back to this iris and finish the iris. Okay, so I think this is looking pretty good. The last thing now is the gel pen. So let's try not to overdo it here. So 
You've probably heard me talk about the ones that I like. I definitely have tried quite a few. And the consensus in the nature journaling community is basically like the Uniball Signo. Um, this one's good for the fine lines. And then the Presto Jumbo Correction Pin. Some people like the Posca paint pins for the bigger lines. Um, I've gone back and forth, but the Posca pin, I think it's better in a lot of ways, but mine was always drying out. So um, we're gonna use this one right now. And what I like to do is, and you can see that I've done it here with the Posca pin and with the Uniball, is all my watercolor palette. I've basically been testing all of the things. I wish I had the green on here, but I've been testing the colors I've been using. So while I'm doing my watercolor painting, I'm basically doing that. And that could be somewhere else in your nature journal. And then when it's time for the um, gel pin, you can also see like, okay, well, what would that look like? Because sometimes if, if this purple right here is that pale, maybe the white won't even really show up on top of it. Um, so what would that actually look like? What if I did dots? And then what about on this dark purple? What would it look like on there? Oh yeah, that's totally different, see? Or what about on that orange? That's from another day. But by having this, it's a really helpful way to test. And what you'll notice, and I've talked about this before, is um, if you push down really hard with this, because this is a ballpoint type pin, um, even though it's a paint pin of sorts, if you push down really hard, it leaves this, um, ooh, it makes a terrible noise. And it leaves like two lines. Let me see if I can get that to focus it leaves a hollow line. See that? See how those one, two, three, four are hollow lines. See how this is a solid line. So if you push a little bit more lightly, see how that's making the solid line. Now I'm going to push hard. For a long time, I couldn't figure out what was making it do that. And it's super annoying um, because this looks totally fake, this double line thing or that hollow line. So um, pushing really hard is gonna make the double line. Pushing lightly is going to leave a better solid line. So um, there you have it. So let's go in here and see what we can do. You can see he's using it to emphasize the edges. If it's the edge with the white paper, oops, refocus. If it's the edge with the white paper, you don't want it to be right on the edge or else that doesn't do anything. But let's just make sure we get these overlap parts. So I'm gonna start here. Ooh, I pushed too hard and it did the double line. Oh man, come on, Marley. None of these opaque pen, opaque white options are really very elegant. So to tell you the truth, they all kind of suck. Um, and it's just choosing one that's slightly better and not overusing it. And whenever you can, reserve whites. Reserving whites is always better. Um, if we had really um, taken our time with this, we probably could have used a... Um, uh, a resist. So those aren't really the greatest tools either, but there are ways to create a resist like with a crayon or um, Frisket is one of the art supplies that does it. Um, liquid resist, things like that, that you put down before you paint your watercolor and then you peel it off and the watercolor doesn't stick in those places. If you have a better opaque tool, let me know kind of like the dark side of watercolor. A lot of people don't like want to admit that they do it or um, people say that they don't do it even though they probably do when they're by themselves. Um, using white gouache or white paint pens to kind of do stuff like this. And so it's not very subtle. Um, it might look more subtle to you because of, from the camera, but for me, like looking at this up close, it. It's not looking that great, but um, I'm just going to go with it. Let me know how yours is working and if you're using the same um, Uniball Signo pin um, that I am. So I'm going to leave it at that. Um, it would be good to put some notes down about my process and how that went. Um, one thing that I don't do, some people are really good at this, is writing down like how long it took. So I'm going to write... Um, one hour, 25 minutes, more or less, um, including chocolate breaks. Including chocolate breaks. 
All right, so you can see. Yes, Marilyn is exactly right. Um, thank you for kind of describing the um, um, describing the mechanics behind how that how that um, ballpoint um, uh, phenomenon is 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 happening. Thanks for um, explaining that. So I'm gonna hold this up a little bit closer so you can see. Um, I'm not exci super excited about the way the white turned out. I could fuss with this a little bit more. But once you put down the white gel pen or any of your opaque white tools, um, you probably don't want to keep coming back to it because um, uh, it's it's kind of problematic. So I see Recovering Soul is uh, recommending a Dr. PH Martin's white ink with a dip pen. I have not tried that. Um, that sounds very interesting. I kind of I should probably do an episode all about um, opaque white drawing tools. So thank you so much for joining in today. Um, that was really fun and hopefully we'll do some more of these in the future and also check out, I'm posting a, um, Inktober challenge for specifically for nature journalers because Inktober is a fun thing that a lot of other sketchers and artists do. Um, and for nature journalers, it's a good excuse to get in the habit of nature journaling every day, at least for one month. So I've posted that up. Um, in that sort of comment section. It's also on my Facebook page. I posted on the Nature Journal Club Facebook page. Um, uh, I haven't posted on my Instagram, but it's on like my Pinterest, my Twitter, all of those things. So check it out um, and vote, um, vote for which of these exercises we're going to do next time. We might do it next Wednesday, in fact. And then Next Sunday, a week from today, um, we're going to be drawing some reptiles and I'm going to be interviewing a guy who has a podcast in Canada um, about animals. And so we're going to be talking about nature journaling your pets. All right, everybody, thank you so much for joining in. And if you can't wait all the way until next week for the next episode of the show, um, check out some of the playlists um, and I'll post links to the recorded version. Thank you everyone who joined in live, Ivea, Recovering Soul, Marilyn, Karen, Melinda, Cindy, uh, I think Candy was here earlier, a um, whole bunch of people um, joined in, Sabrina was here earlier, Wildflowers, thank you all for joining in, Terry, um, that was super fun. Bye. See you next time. Bye.